Good evening and good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're really excited to have you all join us today for the webinar on federal grant applications in the era of the China Initiative, How to Avoid Trouble. My name is Vivian Chung, and I'm the program coordinator for the Anti-Racial Profiling Project at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AJC. So our organization, just to tell you a little bit about ourselves, um, Advancing uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AJC, is a national 501c3 nonprofit founded in 1991 in Washington, D.C. Our mission is to advance the civil and human rights for Asian Americans and to build and promote a fair and equitable society for all. We're pleased to host today's webinar, which focuses on helping scientists and researchers navigate current guidelines from federal grant-making agencies, we're glad to have two distinguished attorneys joining us today as speakers, and Mayor Peter Zeidenberg, partner at Arnt Fox, as well as Catherine Pandrodano, who is a partner at Dorsey and Whitney. During the webinar today, um, they will cover topics on the disclosure of foreign activities, including conflict of interest, as well as current and pending support disclosures and grant applications. They will also cover tax and foreign bank account reporting obligations associated with foreign income received by U.S. researchers. Um, I want to let you all know that we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, and you can use the Q&A portal or chat box to ask your questions. If you have questions during the presentations, please also use uh, the Q&A portal or chat box to send us your questions. And I do want to mention here that for legal and privacy purposes, we ask for everyone to please do not discuss your personal situation or provide any facts related to an investigation or pending litigation during this webinar. Um, and as you guys can see, this webinar will be recorded. And um, before turning it over to our speakers today, I just want to briefly share with you what we are doing here at Advancing Justice AJC to combat the racial profiling of Asian Americans and Asian immigrants. So last year, we launched the Anti-Racial Profiling Project uh, due to increasing concerns from the Asian American community. In recent years, we have seen a sharp rise in the mass investigations of Asian Americans and Asian immigrants, particularly those working in fields of science under programs like the Department of Justice China Initiative. The Anti-Racial Profiling Project offers resources and legal referrals to those impacted by the US government's targeting and profiling of Asian American and immigrant scientists, researchers, and scholars. And many of them have been of Chinese descent. So um, as you can see on the slide here, the project includes three pillars. The first pillar is our legal referral service. So at Advancing Justice AJC, we offer a bilingual attorney referral service that connects impacted persons to attorneys who are experienced with this type of cases. And this service is free and you can contact us using Signal, an encrypted messaging app um, that we use to best protect folks' privacy. And the number is 202-935-6014. Um, my colleague here will also drop it, um, this information in the chat box for you so you can take a look and take down the number. But please note that um, at Advancing Justice AJC, we do not provide direct representation or legal advice on individual cases. This is strictly a legal um, referral service line. And our second pillar is education. So that includes providing bilingual educational materials and trainings, such as Know Your Rights fact sheets and webinars like this one. Um, so we want to provide this information to our community members because we want to make sure people know their rights when they are approached by law enforcement. And please check the chat box again for links to um, our Know Your Rights fact sheets in both Chinese and English. And that should be in simplified and traditional Chinese. Uh, the third pillar is advocacy. 
And we engage in policy analysis, impact litigation, and public education on these and related racial profiling issues for policymakers, the media, and the general public. And I really want to mention that recently we led a sign-on letter to President Biden to call for an end to the Justice Department's China Initiative. Um, we will drop that letter in the um, chat box as well. If you want to take a look at it, I definitely encourage you to do so. And just yesterday, we launched a petition and letter writing campaign to call for a stop on the federal government's racial profiling of Asian American and Asian immigrant scientists, and as well, again, to put an end to the China initiative. We actually worked with directly impacted persons on this who chose to remain anonymous on launching this petition. And we encourage everyone to check it out. It is honestly a great way to take action in helping to stop the criminalization of Asian Americans and Asian immigrants in this country. So um, lastly, if you have specifically specific policy advocacy requests, such as letters, uh, filing amicus briefs in support of your case, please reach out to my colleague, Gazella Kusakawa. Uh, we'll drop her contact information in the chat. And if you're interested in learning more about our legal referral service or about our webinars and know your rights trainings, please reach out to me and um, I will have my colleague drop my email um, in the chat box as well. And we'll also have a uh, contact information slide at the end of the webinar so you can take down this information if you didn't um, get a chance to do so. So without further ado, I want to turn things over to our speakers today. Um, our first speaker is Peter Zeidenberg who is a partner at the law firm Arm Fox, as I mentioned earlier. Peter's practice focuses on defending scientists, individuals, and companies in white collar criminal matters involving uh, contracting fraud, trade secret theft, economic espionage, export violations, and espionage related offenses. Peter represented, um, Peter has represented impacted persons, including Temple University professor, Dr. Jason C, who, had, who was falsely accused of economic espionage. Um, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and thanks for everybody for uh, joining. Um, this is a topic I know that affects uh, directly um, a great many uh, Chinese American uh, scientists. And um, if you are a Chinese American scientist right now in practicing in the United States, um, you are understandably nervous. Um, so let me, um, let me try and join, uh, share this screen. Does that work? Yeah. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do is just go in the next um, 10 to 15 minutes, run through some slides and try and explain, um, you know, from the white collar criminal perspective, how you can uh, best stay out of trouble if you are a Chinese American scientist who also gets uh, grants from the federal government. Um, as you, hmm, let me see. Here we go. Um, as, you, as you've probably seen, um, the headlines uh, I'm just running through, um, many of these people I, I've either represented or they've called me, um, not all obviously, but um, this is just a sampling from the last, I don't know, six months or so um, of all the different professors and, and the headlines. Um, and as you know, this is all stemmed from the China Initiative, which I'm sure um, most, if not all of you, have been hearing a great deal about. That was announced by Attorney General Sessions uh, about two years ago, um, supposedly to combat the national security threat posed by China and focusing prosecutorial attention, identifying those engaged in trade secret theft, hacking, and economic espionage. As I go through these, uh, you know, one of the themes I want to uh, talk about is the fact that the goal of the China Initiative, um, while while unobjectionable, I think to most people, has been uh, it hasn't been followed. Um, 
because while Attorney General Sessions was talking about economic espionage and theft of trade secrets, um, what in reality has happened is they have been going over faulty paperwork. Um, and, you know, I think we've seen some of the really inflammatory uh, statements coming from the Justice Department, from uh, the Attorney General, from the FBI Director talking about uh, the threat that uh, China posed. Um, and, and, and this is one of the statements that um, I think is really uh, very consequential and very concerning. Um, this is from John Demers, who's the Assistant Attorney General for the National Security Division. And uh, John basically said that he wants to do, um, he wants every U.S. Attorney's Office in the country um, and there are 94 of them to be doing one of these cases every year. And that's the goal. And as you might uh, imagine, there aren't 94 cases a year to be brought, not ones with merit. And so as a result of the pressure being uh, felt in these U.S. Attorney's Office, they're bringing cases that have nothing to do with uh, economic espionage, or with um, theft of trade secrets. NIH has been, along with uh, the National Security Division, uh, Department of Energy, the Department of Defense um, in particular, um, and the National Science Foundation have been particularly aggressive. Um, NIH sent out 18,000 letters to administrators um, asking them to basically scrutinize any of their scientists that have ties to China. And the result of that has been a, a tremendous number of uh, faculty members, research scientists who have ended up um, being prosecuted and if not prosecuted, uh, losing their job and losing their funding. So the way these begin is the universities take over these um, uh, their task basically with doing the investigation and without the knowledge of, of, you know, the scientists, the universities access the email accounts of these um, professors and they're looking at, on the one hand, the grant applications to see what was disclosed and then they're going through the emails to see if that there's anything in there that they think causes, uh, that was arguably disclosable. And in particular, they're looking at the bio sketch, the grant application, just in time forms, conflict of interest. And then they're looking to see what ties, if any, uh, the scientist has in China. Um, and so what, what ends up happening um, is they're, they're looking, let me go first what they're not looking for. There, if you think you're off the hook because you never transferred anything to China, you never disclosed anything to anyone, uh, sadly, you're mistaken. Um, you should be off the hook for that, but that is really not what these um, cases have been about. What they're looking at is, um, were you ever a member of a talent program in China? Were you ever affiliated with a Chinese university or research facility? Um, did you ever get payments from anyone in China? Um, those are the things they're looking for. And most of the time, these things aren't disclosed because frankly, the grant application paperwork uh, never explicitly called for these types of disclosures. So the biggest the biggest red flag is the uh, is the Thousand Talent Program. It doesn't, you know, Thousand Talent Program is the most well known, but there are many other talent programs in China, so um, they're all viewed with a great deal of suspicion by the Department of Justice uh, and these granting agencies. They view them as sinister, and so if you've participated in one, or even if you have not participated in one, but you discussed joining one, you are going to be flagged. Um, many, many times um, professors um, go through the process, the application process for a talent program, and they actually 
um, are awarded the program. And when they get the program, they find out, oh gosh, it requires me to move to China for nine months. It was requiring a commitment that I did not anticipate. And the professor will say, you know, I can't do that. I, I, I'm not, um, I'm not going to do that. And um, what ends up happening is that um, the sponsoring agency in China says, well, don't worry about it. We just want to, you know, the, do the best you can when you come over here, give a lecture. And so from the professor's standpoint um, and mindset, he's never, you know, he's not a member, but the university in China will have that professor listed on their website, unbeknownst to the professor. And that will be discovered by the university or by the government, you know, in this country. And they will find that to be, you know, a, as proof that you actually were a talent uh, member. So if there's an undisclosed affiliation, these are some of the results. Um, your lab can be closed, your funding sources shut down, um, dismissed from the position. Um, uh, you, your access to your emails and your documents will be cut off and possible criminal prosecution. Again, these are the risk factors that you should, that, that, that really put a target on your back. Uh, ethnic Chinese, um, you have US funded grants, uh, typically from NIH, National Science Foundation says NSD, it should be NSF, uh, DOE, uh, Department of Defense and NASA. Um, and then affiliations with Chinese universities and participation in a talent program. So don't expect uh, unfortunately, uh, to be treated fairly, um, not just by the government, but by your university. Um, some universities have been terrific. You know, we know um, at MIT, they're paying the legal fees mm -hmm. of the professor there. But um, in, for the most part, um, that's not, well, that, that's almost unheard of. In fact, that's the only case I've heard of where they've done that. And in many cases, they have summarily dismissed tenured professors, uh, even without uh, asking them for an explanation, just simply based on the emails that they find. Um, obviously, the consequences from this are, are, are dire. Um, the reputational harm, there's a great deal of expense involved defending yourself in these cases, um, the loss of grant funding. Um, it, it's, it can be um, quite devastating, as you might imagine. So how best to protect yourself? Uh, the key is transparency. And of course, transparency is, is um, it, it's very easy to say, it's harder to do, because these forms um, that need to be filled out are ambiguous. At least, um, you know, that's what the granting agencies have acknowledged at least um, in various forms, that that these um, reporting requirements have changed, um, and their interpretation of them have changed. So, for a long time, a lot of people did not believe or understand that foreign affiliations were called for in these grant applications. Now they most definitely are. So you have to disclose any affiliations you have in China. Keep all your records, um, make sure you communicate everything with your university, with your dean, with your provost, with your department chair, make sure they understand what you're doing in China and when. Do not participate in any talent program if you're getting federal grants. It's just going to be a nightmare for you. Um, be sure to disclose everything on your bio sketch, um, on your conflict of interest form with the university and any Chinese grants, um, it's a must that they be uh, listed. If you have undisclosed affiliations, do not just volunteer this information. It's, um, I've had clients do this um, for the best of reasons and it's created enormous headaches for them. Um, I would get counsel from an attorney if you have undisclosed affiliations so they can be understood and they can be handled 
um, with the advice of counsel. Uh, make copies of all your work, emails, and files, and keep a set on a hard drive off-site because in the worst case scenario, um, your access to all of these emails can be cut off without any warning. And that those emails and those uh, documents are the ones you're gonna need to defend yourself. So operate under the assumption that everything could be cut off to you and keep hard copies, not hard copies, but keep a hard drive with a, a mirrored copy of everything on your computer. Um, back it up all the time, and then try and keep a, a set of that all out of your house and somewhere you that will not be taken if there's a search of your home. If the university um, tells you that they have questions and want to talk to you, um, find out who's going to be present. If they're going to have outside counsel present, which they often do, then you should have outside counsel present. It's only fair. And, and it's a sign if they have outside counsel present that things have escalated and these are not just routine questions. If the FBI or other federal agents approach you, and if they do so, they'll probably come to your home or your office early in the morning when you're not expecting them. They'll be very polite. They'll be very well dressed. And uh, you're going to feel obligated to speak with them you have no obligation to speak with them. You have no obligation to answer any questions. My, my advice would be to politely decline, get their cards, tell them you'll have counsel, contact them. You have every right not to speak with them. And in most cases, that's the best advice. They're not your friends. Uh, if you're arrested or you're charged, you have the right to remain silent, don't talk, Wait till you get an attorney. Um, the agents will try and speak with you. They will try and speak with your wife. Or if you have a husband, they'll speak with your husband. Um, you might want to talk to your wife or your husband in advance and tell them um, if agents come, but we'll tell them we'll get a lawyer and we'll have our lawyer contact you. And that's what I got. So good luck, everybody. And then uh, we'll have questions at the end. Yes, thank you, Peter, for providing this informative presentation. And as um, Peter just mentioned, again, for those in the audience who have questions, please send them into um, the Q&A box or drop it in um, the chat box, and we'll address them in the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And so our next speaker is Catherine Pangirodano. Catherine is a partner at the law firm Do um, Dorsey and & Whitney and corporate group head in the firm's New York office. She leads the firm's globally recognized US-China transactional practice. And as a prominent Chinese speaking business lawyer in New York, Catherine together with the government grants lawyers and white collar criminal defense lawyers at Dorsey & Whitney's China Initiative Task Force, um, they have successfully helped scientists, researchers, universities, and research labs navigate the difficult territory of the DOJ's China Initiative investigations and cases. So Catherine, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Vivian. I want to thank the organizers first for inviting me and for putting us together to talk about such an important topic. Um, Joy, if you can go to the next slide. Um, as you can see, my background and experience as a corporate attorney makes me very privileged to have the opportunity of working with a lot of scientists, particularly medical device inventors, uh, biologists, medical professors, etc. cetera. Um, that's why about um, two and a half years ago, after November, uh, 2018, when the former general Attor attorney general uh, formed the China Initiative Task Force at um, the um, Department of Justice. I led the Dorsey White Collar Criminal uh, Defense Team to form a response to the DOJ's China Initiative, which is called Dorsey and Winnie China Initiative Task Force. 
So uh, because of this task force, we've had the opportunity to do what Peter does. You know, we have defended and protected a lot of professors and scientists around the country. And we, we worked with the universities, hospitals and research institutions as well, because oftentimes the institutions themselves might be under investigation by NIH, by DOJ, or by any other grant making federal agencies as well. Um, I only have 15 minutes today to go through my presentation. I don't want to repeat a lot of the helpful advice that Peter has already given you. So I'm just going to make three points today. Um, Joy, if you can go to slide number 10, um, which is your slide number, I think, 34, uh, 44. Yeah, your slide number 44, about the three types of cases. Yeah, thank you. So there are really three types of cases out there. The first type is the rare, very few cases where, yes, the US government caught a few spies from China and then they are the real bad actors, but this is a very small number and small percentage of cases. The second type of cases are um, the Professor Xi Xiaoxing type of cases where the defendants were completely wrongfully accused and they were innocent. But the vast majority of the cases today are the third type of cases, the disclosure cases. It's really hard for the government actually to catch a spy. Um, and it's, um, it's rare that they completely falsely accuse somebody who's completely innocent. But the disclosure cases are plenty out there. Uh, all the arrests that you have noticed recently, um, including Professor Charles Lieber from Harvard and Professor Gaonchen from MIT. Those are the disclosure cases. Um, and there, those are three types of disclosures. Uh, back to the same slide, Joy. Three types of disclosure cases, um, violation of the grant. Um, and uh, because uh, under the uh, False Claims Act, if you apply for federal grants to fund your scientific research, you are subject to the False Claims Act. So if you make a mistake and um, basically fraudulently disclose or fail to disclose certain information in the federal grant applications, the False Claims Act will apply. And then the second type of those uh, disclosure cases are the tax cases, you know, if you have income for, from your um, foreign positions, whether it's the Thousand Talents Project or Changjiang Xuezhe or some sort of secondary positions at a Chinese university, you might have some foreign incomes from that second position or even just a sponsored trip or a conference where you got paid. And, um, these uh, foreign incomes are required to be reported on your U.S. tax returns if you are a U.S. taxpayer. So as you can see from a lot of the recent prosecutions, um, the federal prosecutors are going down very hard on undisclosed foreign incomes. And the third type of cases are related to the tax cases, um, foreign bank accounts, FBAR disclosure cases. So basically, if you are a U.S. person uh, and if you have a foreign bank account, you are required to, to disclose this foreign bank account if the uh, amounts under the foreign bank accounts in aggregate exceed $10,000 per year. And you need to file an FBAR report under the FinCEN requirements. Now, I call them three types of cases, but oftentimes one case can cover um, three accounts, right? So for example, um, Professor Chen Gang's case and also Professor Lieber's cases, um, those cases all cover multiple accounts, both grant frauds um, and tax and FBAR issues. Now let's go to the next slides. So as you know, scientists are required to uh, disclose their ties to Chinese institutions. When you apply for grants from the NIH, NSF, DOE, DOD, et cetera. 
uh, failure to disclose oftentimes uh, can be an oversight uh, because the forms that you are asked to fill out can be very lengthy. And a lot of professors and scientists consider basically um, their um, uh, positions in a Chinese university, right? Changjiang Xuezhe to be an honorary position, a celebratory position rather than a real second job. And despite of what the contract actually says, um, the actual obligation can be very different. Joy, if we can go back to slide number six, where it says thousand talents contract, I'm going to show you um, that's 40 on your master slides. I'm going to show you what a typical, uh, you just passed it. Slide number six. Next, yes, thank you. So this is a typical thousand talents contract. By the way, this is already public information. Um, a typical thousand talents contract, um, there are three types, right? So the senior thousand talents, the junior thousand talents, and the entrepreneur thousand talents project. Uh, the senior one usually lasts for three years and it requires a lot of commitment, you know, um, full time in China. Uh, and also you may be asked to construct a lab. You might be asked to train um, several PhD students at the Chinese university. Um, in reality, your actual commitments and your actual um, activities in China might be very limited because you are still a full-time professor in the US at your home institution. It's virtually impossible for you to actually fulfill a contract like this. But this hasn't certainly hasn't stopped the US government from alleging your actual activities and commitment in China are consistent with what this contract says. So you have to be very careful because oftentimes if this type of contract is in your um, university email, you should assume that um, when the university images your computer, they should be able to get their hands on this contract and they're going to read it the way that's very broad and they're going to read it literally, meaning whatever the contractor says, even if you actually didn't perform, they might consider it to be your actual activities under the contract. So um, you will have to be very, very careful when you um, disclose this type of contracts. So always to have an attorney um, and then to be careful of how you interpret this contract and how you explain your actual activities under your contract. And back to the slide we were at before, uh, Joyce, sorry, I'm giving you challenges. Uh, that, that's slide number 11 or number 45 on your deck. Next one. Yes. So. What I want to ask you to do is to very much focus on um, what's going to come in the next month or two months, because it's already day March uh, 4th. Uh, if you are a university professor or researcher, you know that the annual certification season is coming up and the annual grant application season is coming up. So this year, when you fill out, whether it's the NIH grant application or your university CLI form or your OAR form, the outside activity report form, you should keep all these cases in mind and fill out the paperwork in a way that's 100% accurate, truthful, and up-to-date. On the next slide, I'm going to show you what this CLR form looks like. Joy, next. So this is a typical COR, uh, COI form conflict of interest form. Uh, I'm using the NYU example here. They have already updated their form to particularly cover 
the thousand talents, which I think is helpful because in the past they didn't specify, you know, a thousand talent participation counts as outside professional activity. But now they particularly add this provision to make it very clear. But you have to be careful, even if your university hasn't done the job of spelling out what those activities can be, you should definitely count your um, talents program, whether it's Changjiang Xuezhe or Qianren Jihua or anything else, or even if you are not working with a Chinese university, but you're working with a private company, a US company or a Chinese company, and you're providing them some scientific advice, you are on their advisory board and um, uh, you should disclose it. You might think, well, the income there is very limited or there is no income for my advisory position at this outside company. But remember, most universities have adopted a zero dollar threshold these days. So whether you have derived income from the outside activity or not. It's, um, it's not for you to judge whether that's relevant or not. You just have to disclose it. Then your university will make a judgment call there. On the next slide. This is an outside activity uh, disclosure form. Again, you can see a typical question there can be, do you or an immediate family member of yours receive any income or research support from foreign government or from foreign institutions. Again, you know, even if you yourself, now you've heard about all these cases, you're very careful now, but if your mother has a bank account in China and you ask the Chinese university to wire money into your mother's bank account, um, and then you leave a paper trail in your email or WeChat, right? That can be caught as well. So uh, most universities would cover your immediate family member. Next slide. So the COR form and the um, uh, OAR forms, those are university level forms. Now let's quickly talk about the federal forms. Um, for example, in 2020, NIH and NSF and other federal ground making agencies have synchronized their disclosure requirements. So the sessions that you need to be very, very careful of are the biosketch section, other support, including current and pending support. Uh, those are usually the sections where you need to disclose your outside position. Even if you think it's an honorary position, um, you should disclose it. And other support, I want to talk a little bit more about other support because this is really important. Joy, if you can go on to the next slide. Under the old NIH and NSF rules, other support means other support for your, the project that you are seeking money from the federal grant making agency. So most scientists understand the word projects to mean for example, if you are PI, the word project means the project you are working on and that you are seeking federal money from. And that is a particular topic that you are going to exercise your scientific investigation in. That's a typical definition of a project in the scientific world. So in the past, NIH requires you to disclose other current and pending support for ongoing projects. That's why most scientists you know, tripped over because they think, oh, the Thousand Talents program money I received from China, it's not to support the same project that I'm receiving money from the NIH. It's just for something in general, right? Um, for my general status as a very renowned scientist and for my very soft commitment to these Chinese universities, it's not to fund the same project. However, NIH, expanded the rule actually last year, 2020. Joy, you can go on to the next slide. In 2020, you can see the new disclosure. That's the rule that they're going to apply, which says all resources made available to you in support of your research efforts. So they got rid of the words projects and programs and they use research efforts in general. 
And they specifically says, now these support also include in-kind contribution, uh, which includes office, lab space, equipment, supplies, PhD students, employees, manpower, etc. So it's really, really broad now. And you have to really comply with the current rule. Unfortunately, NIH also thinks the current rule applies to the past behavior, even though their old rules clearly said something different. But according to NIH and NSF interpretation, they think the old rule cover the thousand talents and outside talents programs as well. And they refuse to acknowledge the new rules are brand new and an expansion of their old rules. They're saying the new rules are clarifications of the old rules. So bad news for you if you have old like NIH grants from two years ago and the, the rules at the time, even though it should apply to pending support for your projects and programs. In fact, NIH is still going to interpret it in a way that is consistent with their current disclosure rules. I know this is complicated, but I think the takeaway point for you is going forward, you should be very, very broad and also accurate in your NIH disclosure. Um, a quick comparison of the new rule and the old rules are on the next slides. So basically they expanded beyond the specific project or proposal to cover any research efforts and they also added in-kind contribution. So, and then I think I want to spend a little bit time to talk about tax and FBAR and then give you some practical advice. So um, basically, first, um, I just mentioned to you that if you have foreign income, whether it's from your talents projects or secondary job in a Chinese university or your role of you know, advisory board at a biotech company, all these incomes in China, you need to disclose them on your US tax returns, right? And then some of you may ask, well, there's a treaty between US and China. Can I just basically qualify myself under the treaty? No, it doesn't work that way. Basically, it's going to be very detailed. I won't go into the details. But the treaty doesn't work in the way that you can just offset in your mind how the tax credits are applied. So you basically have to disclose and report your foreign income on your US tax returns. Um, and then FBAR, what is FBAR? Most people probably have never heard about FBAR before. It stands for Foreign Bank Account Reporting. It basically means a United States person that has a financial interest in or signature authority over foreign financial accounts must file an FBAR if the aggregate value of the foreign financial accounts exceeds $10,000 at any time during a calendar year. Now, a US person means a US citizen or a green card holder, um, a corporation, a partnership, an LLC, a trust or a state. So it's very broad. So if you have a company in China, you formed a company in China and you are the CEO, or if you have signatory power, authority over the company's bank account, you have to file the FBAR on behalf of the company. And then also what is a foreign financial account? It includes a bank account. It includes a brokerage account. It also includes a mutual fund accounts. And the $10,000 disclosure threshold I just mentioned, that's the aggregate threshold. So if you have a savings account and a brokerage account, you have to add up the money for any given calendar year. And the way to report this is to file the FBAR report on the FinCEN form 114. Um, so three takeaway points for you. Uh, let's go to the last slide, Joy. Do and don'ts. So whether it's the time for you to disclose to university or make your grant application, or whether you are questioned by a university 
uh, integrity office and you're working with your attorney to respond to their questions, these are my advice regarding what to do and what not to do. A lot of them overlap with what Peter just told you. Um, I would advise you to really use your calendar. If you have a Google calendar or Outlook calendar, go back to your calendar, go back to your passport, look at your visa stamps and really refresh your memory as to where you were in China or in a different place and what you did during that period of time. That's going to make your disclosure a lot more accurate. The second thing I would advise you to do is to check on Google and also on Baidu to see what the internet is saying about you. Because even though the Chinese government is trying to delete all the people trail and all the internet footprint about those thousand talents or Changjiang Xuezhe program, the reality is when something is on the internet, it's really hard to completely remove it. So, and the US government is doing this, FBI is doing this, your university is doing this. They are hiring people to check both Chinese and English websites. So you need to know what the internet is saying about you as well. So you can be consistent and truthful and also use the internet to remind yourself because it's possible that three years ago, you went back to Shanghai and you gave a presentation at a university and during the announcement of the presentation, they mentioned all your positions, social status in China. And th that announcement went onto the internet and it's still on the internet. So you need to know what that announcement is saying about you because the US government will see this as well. And um, of course you need to have your own attorney because your university's attorney is not your attorney. I got a client who told me, well, you know, the university hired an attorney for me because, well, I'm a faculty member, right? So when they interviewed me, that attorney is in the room. Well, it turns out that attorney is not your attorney. It's the university's attorney. It can be the university's outside counsel. It can also be an attorney in in-house counsel working together with the research integrity office or with the provost. So their attorney is not your attorney. You need to have your own attorney. The things don't do, don't delete emails, right? Because um, if you delete emails, they will know that you deleted emails and then they will think you're trying to um, uh, destroy evidence. Um, don't talk to your colleagues and friends about your cases and concerns. This is what Professor Lieber at Harvard did, right? So he talked to a research associate of him after FBI questioned him, at least based on the court filing. Um, he told the research associate not to tell FBI about his Thousand Talents involvement. And then the associate now is a witness in his case, working with the prosecution. So your conversations, your WeChat text messages, your emails with your colleagues and friends, they're not protected by attorney-client privilege. So the right person for you to talk to is your lawyer rather than other people who are not protected by privilege. Um, and the last Catherine, thing- Catherine, oh, go ahead. I was just wanna quickly mention is, we're at um, time, you, so Yeah, if you go can ahead. remember one thing from this presentation from me, it's the one thing that's relatively easier for you to do, which is to um, go back and amend your tax returns and your FBAR reports if you haven't gotten clean on those accounts. That's Thank it. you so much, Thank Catherine. You for this presentation. And I wanted to just um, leave some, a bit of time for questions. And um, we got a few questions here um, from folks. And um, I just wanna encourage the audience again to please drop your questions either in our chat box or in the Q&A portal. So um, one of the first questions I have here is, um, and these are for, um, either Peter or Catherine. Uh, this person is asking, how do I know if the FBI agent is actually an agent? How do I verify the identity of the agent? I, I don't think you have to worry about fake FBI agents. They'll, they'll present identification, um, but um, that is the least of your worries that um, pretend FBI agents will be interviewing. The problem will be they are real FBI agents. Not that they're fake. 
All right. And then I have another question here. If this person asks, if I am asked to fill out a conflict of interest form, will I need an attorney or can I just fill out the form on my own? I mean, well, I, I, I would say you can do that. You're going to have to do this on your own um, and just be over-inclusive if there's any, I mean, as Catherine has noted, the language on these conflict of interest forms has become generally um, more explicit and more uh, open-ended and broader and uh, don't be cute. You know what I mean? Don't, if in doubt, list it. Right. And then the fact that a scientist that has to ask you this question tells us something, right? I've been working with, you know, professors and scientists for years on their corporate projects. This is the first time people asking us, you know, hey, I'm just filling out a routine form of this university. Do I need to have a lawyer? Um, you don't have to. There's no requirement you need to have a lawyer, but you just need to be correct when you fill out the form. Because unfortunately, the consequence of making these, what we think of as administrative or paperwork error can be easily criminalized these days. Got it. Um, thank you both. And um, we got another question here. Um, so, oh, sorry, I'm just trying to find the, right one. Um, how do I make sure I follow all the most updated rules and get everything right so I don't get in trouble? Don't, don't get into trouble. Are there That's resources available to help me? That's a great question. So uh, university forms, usually these days, universities all use a software. So they send you a link, you click through, right? And when you click through, look for question marks next to each question. Chances are when you click that question mark, it's going to expand. A window will pop out and give you a five minutes webinar about, you know, what this rule is about, um, similar to the tax forms. There are instructions after instructions, but it's up to you to read it. So I would say the guidance are definitely out there. You just have to read through them. The other resource is the University of Research Integrity Office. Um, they organize seminars, training sessions. I know for you tenured professors out there, most of you think I've been doing this for 20 years, right? I don't need a research integrity officer to teach me how to write a grant proposal. Uh, only the new postdoc or the new faculty members need to attend those training sections. Well, the reality is the rule have changed. So if your university research integrity office is organizing these seminars, you should attend and obtain a record of your attendance as well. Thank you. And we got another question here. Um, How do I know if I am being investigated? Um, uh, generally, you don't. Um, you don't until you're told that you are. Um, so the FBI isn't going to, there's no way to confirm or inquire whether you're under investigation. Um, a lot of times, the first time you find out you're under investigation is when you get called in by the university well, it could be agents showing up at your door, um, which happens. Um, it could be a search warrant of your home and your office, which also happens. Um, or it could be that your university uh, dean says, could you come in? Um, we have a couple of questions. And it turns out when you go into the office, um, they got a half a dozen lawyers in there, uh, outside counsel, um, security, uh, and the dean excuses himself and leaves you to answer all these questions. I've had clients have all those things happen to them. Um, other times it is a little bit more benign. There'll be um, email inquiries, you know, and they can start off um, pretty low key and then they tend to escalate. And oftentimes when I 
get involved, I find out that they've been answering questions back and forth for six months. Um, and it, there's, the university will be basically working uh, at the behest of NIH or uh, National Science Foundation. Um, and then they pass all that information along in a report to the agency. So there's a range of ways that you, you would find out. Um, uh, so you just have to, um, you know, the, the key is once you find out that you're under investigation is to get counsel early on um, rather than trying to handle it on your own. Right. Thank you, Peter. And another question I got here is, I have heard about searches for electronic devices. What are our legal rights for searches? Well, I, I, it sounds like you're talking about when you're leaving or um, exiting the country. Um, and at that point, um, they have a right to uh, take a look at your device coming in and out of the country. Um, I, you're not under any obligation um, uh, to give them your password, um, but they will try and image um, your device and they have a right to do that. Um, if, you're, if you're coming uh, in or out of the country. Now, if you're in the country and they wanna see your, your stuff, you have no obligation to share that. Um, if it's a university computer, of course, that's different. But if it's your cell phone or your own laptop, um, you simply say, you know, sorry, no. Right. Yeah, most professors communicate through their university emails, even on non-university related activities and responsibilities, just out of convenience. So if you've been communicating with a Chinese university, using your American university email accounts, um, they have server, right? So it's their account. It's the university's email account. So they can get your emails either by imaging your computer or downloading it from the server. Got it. Okay, and then the next question, I have one here. Any potential new policy change from the current Biden administration regarding this China initiative? And I can um, go ahead and respond first um, from Advancing Justice AGC's point of view. Um, I mean, we're hopeful that the new administration will be open to policy change and reform. And, um, and I don't know if most of you have heard, but the recent presidential memorandum countering anti-Asian racism um, can be a first step in what we believe will be a longer road to combating racial bias and discrimination. And um, at Advancing Justice AJC, um, as I mentioned previously, we are doing some advocacy efforts, including a sign-on letter um, with over 120 organizations and individual signatories to President Biden, um, calling for an end to the uh, Justice Department's China Initiative, as well as um, several other recommendations. There may also be a potential upcoming hearing with the House Oversight um, Committee of Reform, so specifically the Subcommittee of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. Um, that is also something that we are uh, working on uh, pushing. So hopefully if um, there is a hearing to come that will also um, raise more awareness um, on the Hill in general. And um, Peter and Catherine, I don't know if you guys would like to add anything. Um, your thoughts on new policy changes with the Biden administration. In 15 seconds, I'd say hope, hope that it'll change and, and refocus um, properly on, on what it was meant to stop initially, which is theft of intellectual property and economic espionage and get off this uh, ridiculous, um, you know, focus on paperwork errors for legal conduct. Um, but we don't know if that's really going to change. We're, we're just hopeful that it will. Um, but I don't, it's anybody's guess. Mm -hmm. And from me, you know, I noticed that, you, you know, some um, U.S. attorneys, for example, Andrew Lelling from Massachusetts uh, stepped down 
um, he is one of the uh, you know main hawks in the China Initiative. He um, arrested um, a lot of the professors in, in the Harvard and MIT area. So that kind of a replacement of U.S. attorneys around the country, um, together with the change of administration, that gives me hope that because China Initiative is an enforcement initiative, right? I hope, you know, given these changes and replacements, I think the enforcement hopefully will become more reasonable and proportionate um, rather than over, overly zealous um, compared to the underlying mistakes. But, you know, my advice to the audience is, well, don't count on other people, right? Don't count on the new president and don't count on a different U.S. attorney in your district to save your future. There are things you can do to protect yourself and your family, your career and your freedom. That's, you know, to get your tax clean, get your FBAR filed, get your COI and OAR form correctly filled out and don't make mistakes in your NIH and other grant applications. Those are the things you can control and then you can, you know, take charge of. I would focus on these. All right, great. And it looks like we're going just a little bit over time here. Um, but lastly, again, I, um, we have provided all of our contact information as well as the speaker's contact uh, information here um, and also how to reach Advancing Justice AJC's legal referral line. And again, if you're interested in setting up a Know Your Rights webinar for your organization or your community, you can contact me by email or if you're interested in learning more about um, the Anti-Racial Profiling Project in general. Um, if you would like to discuss specifically policy advocacy requests, if you have those, please reach out to my colleague, uh, Gazella Kusakawa. My apologies, we were not able to answer all of the questions that you guys had. There were um, um, abundance of questions but I hope that this webinar was helpful to you today. Um, please feel free to sign up for um, our email list to stay informed about any updates on the project. And again, I will also like to thank um, our speakers today, Catherine and Peter, for your contribution and your participation. Um, this has been great. And again, there will be a recording of the webinar available, which will we, uh, we will send to all the participants after the webinar. So again, thank you everyone for joining this webinar and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye. bye.